Well, thanks everyone for coming here. Um, I'm Carter, and this is a talk. I work for Sigital, and I'm going to be talking about video game security. And uh, let's get to it. So I'm going to cover a bunch of high-level stuff, kind of more business level, and then kind of dive down toward the end of the talk into some more technical analysis, um, which includes a demonstration of some game hacking. So who am I? I'm a senior security consultant at Sigital. Previously did security research. Uh, I'm a husband, always learning. I love music, particularly anything techno. I love glitch hop. And I like playing video games, and I like hacking them after I've played them. Sometimes if I can't play them very well, then I just hack them from the get-go. And that's how I got here. Is they're really fun. I love playing video games. And they're really hard to win. So I was left with two options when playing them. If I wanted to win, I had to either practice a whole bunch, takes so much time, or just cheat. So I decided to cheat, and that, that's just how I learned to hack. And in the end, that uh, ended with a security career. So it started off with hacking side-scrollers. Uh, I was playing a multi multiplayer um, online role-playing game, massively multiplayer, and saw somebody flying around the screen, and that's not normally a thing. You can't do that in this game. Like, how'd they do that? So I Googled around, how do you, how do you fly? How, I got to fly in this game. And followed a few tutorials, and they said, OK, download this program, run this, change this byte, do that. And that was all reverse engineering. I didn't know it at the time. I just thought it was you know, flying in a game. Uh, so eventually I flew around in, in, the, in the screen, and it was really fun, and I loved it. It was addicting, and I had to get more of it. And that's what led to my career in security. There's so much crossover between video game hacking and the security industry in general. Uh, there's, there's a lot of cross, uh, crossover between skill sets, um, such as uh, things that you need to do when you're uh, performing threat modeling, for instance, achieving a goal. Um, and, and having an objective and working toward that goal in a very systematic way. There's also reverse engineering at, at, at play. And there's a lot of that with, with game hacking. There's also more specific network protocol analysis that, that has elements of re reverse engineering as well. Um, so that's all well and good. Um, but then, then when you look at it, you're like, OK, so there's cheating, right? But then there's so much more to it, to video game hacking. Um, in the video games and video games in general, it's not just about cheating. You've got to you've got to look at the full stack of a system. I mean, there's there's the whole uh, there's there's the servers involved. There's the game clients. There's the network. There's customer service representatives who you call up and then you get somebody. You know, you figure out some information about a player if you want uh, if you want their account and they're a high level player. If you want to take over their account, you could either attack the servers or you could just call up customer service and say, hey, I'm that player. Give me their account information. Use a little social engineering. So it's not all necessarily technical. And so analyzing the video game th you know, whole, whole stack um, is a threat modeling exercise. Seeing who, what, what things an attacker, what assets an attacker can go after, and seeing how they would go after them. You've also got to identify those risks, as well as any existing controls. Uh, or protections that are in place, and identify maybe some gaps in the controls. See where you can help uh, fill in those gaps to, the, to protect those, those assets that are important to your video game. There's also reverse engineering, taking apart the client. Maybe the server is available. Maybe it's an open source server uh, that you can analyze. Uh, sometimes this is the case. You can also analyze the network protocol itself and figure out how the client and the server interact with each other. So that's kind of an overview that applies uh, to video games in general. And uh, we're going to dive into the risks. The business risks are cyclical, let's say. They, if, if a video game gets hacked, it hits the news, and that's not good for a company. It causes brand tarnishment, which then leads to players not wanting to play the game because if, if you're not protecting your game, then there's a bunch of hackers running around, and then it just it loses its fun appeal. It's just not, it's not as fun if everybody's ruining the game. 
So then uh, if this happens repeatedly, then the customers will become disloyal. Uh, if, if uh, let's say, the intellectual property is stolen, the, the game content, the, the, the source code, let's say, the, uh, to the server is, is stolen, your IP is ripped off, that's, that's going to cause a loss of revenue. So there's a lot of things at play rather than just cheating. Um, there's, there's ways that attackers will target various games based off of um, these business models. So like freemium versus subscription versus uh, one-time payment games where you only have to buy the game and then you can play it forever. So um, freemium models, the risks might be that you get to get the in-game items for free, the, the, pr the, the paid-only game benefits. A lot, of the, a lot of them have pro features or premium items or whatever they are. And if you get those for free, then the freemium business model fails. Uh, similar with subscription-based, if you can play the game without having to pay a subscription, you're going to lose money. Uh, and lastly, with one-time payments, a lot of times these types of games are blocked by DRM. Uh, so if you can bypass that, that'll lead to piracy. Well, there's a whole discussion about that. But piracy will happen, and um, then, then uh, DRM t plays a role in that. Uh, so let's dive into the technical aspects. So there's technical risks, such as accounts getting hijacked or items uh, in the game being stolen from other players, that's not a good thing. You want to protect against that. Cheating, automation, botting, so let's say there's repetitive tasks that are done in the game in order to get uh, progressed throughout the levels of whatever the game is. Uh, if you can automate that, you know, I used to do this, at least I'd, I'd boot up my program and I'd go to bed and in the morning I had just ranked up, you know, 50 levels and wh whereas all the other people, were 50 levels behind because they had to actually sleep. So that's, that's not something that you want to permit in your game, generally. Uh, denial of service. If you can't play the game, that's a problem. Um, fraud, fraud in the virtual economy. I economy. Some games are pretty cool. Uh, they actually allow fraud to take place. It's part of the game. Whereas most games don't like that. Uh, so, so more the, the realistic sim games Sometimes there will be situations where if, if one player lies and rips off or cheats or hacks their way into getting another player's um, currency, that's, that's part of the game. Deal with it. Um, but most of the time, that's not the case. And also, the game, game itself, uh, like we said previously, piracy uh, is something that most companies are going to want to avoid. Um, so the, the, the risks as well, the business risks, will vary by game genre. So a first-person shooter is going to have different, it's going to have crossover, but it's also going to have differing risks than, say, an online role-playing game. So uh, bragging rights and competitive advantage are going to be huge goals of attackers playing a first-person shooter. They might do this by uh, stat padding or creating aim bots or wall hacks so that they can see through walls and, and gain some advantage over other players as opposed to playing the game fairly. Whereas uh, online role-playing games, you might, uh, if there's a player that's invested, you know, a thousand hours into a, a, a game account, and they've got the three level hundred whatever characters that are that are highly envied among the rest of the clans, somebody's going to want them, and they might actually try and uh, hack into maybe a forum or something, and then pivot from an, a web. Um, a web server into the internal network in order to compromise the game server so that they could get the account. Like, there's so many different ways we can do this. Um, there's private servers where an attacker would uh, avoid uh, paying subscriptions. And then real-time strategy games, for those of you who played, sometimes the maps uh, don't have full visibility, and you can gain an advantage by seeing all of the players' movements and uh, resources at a time as opposed to a lot of the games where you have to send out scouts and you have to constantly be monitoring, okay, do I have an up-to-date version of where my enemy is in the game's progression? If you see it all the time, that's a huge advantage to you. And then by platform, uh, the, the, the gaming platform, console, mobile, window, uh, you know, Windows, li Linux, Mac, web browsers, all that, um, there, you're going to see varying uh, types of uh, attacks against those. And you're going to see varying forms of pr protection against those. Say, 
with a web-based game, you're going to see a lot more server-side protection. Hopefully, you're going to see server-side protection in, in, in all the games, but you're going to see it valued a lot more by the developer of a web-based game because the, the browser can be hacked. The, the browser, the, it's not even really a hack. You just make your own browser. Like, you can make it do whatever you want. You send the data that you want to send. And that's just how it is. Whereas game consoles, those, those require a much more specific skill set. And you've got to, sometimes you've got to be able to desolder and manipulate um, bits and bytes as they're, you perfectly time it. And there, there's a lot more to it. So they're going to focus their protections more on the client side itself, meaning the game console. They're going to rely on the protection in the console. Uh, not always the case, but um, this tends to happen. Uh, video game assets. So going back to the threat modeling. Uh, example or, or, or process rather. We can have video game assets that are game content, the patches, the downloadable content, that sort of stuff. Uh, player account information, uh, billing information. That's, that's always interesting. If, if you're, you've got five million subscribers to your game, you've got five million people using some form of payment, which means five million targets to rip them off if you gained access to that billing information. So you want to protect that. It's the, there, there's uh, fraud and cheat. cheat the, the detection data itself that's telling you whether or not people are cheating, that could be an asset. Because if you identify that, oh, the, there's this, this monitoring process that's sending back data saying, yeah, this person's cheating. If you just kill that process or you modify that data, even though you're cheating, that, that cheat data itself is invalid. So that's an asset. Um, and we already mentioned uh, customer service representatives or their accounts that you could compromise. So then there's, we just discuss, discussed the things that attackers can target. These are some of the things you can, you can use to protect those things that attackers would go after. So you can use encrypted protocols uh, such as VPN tunnels or uh, anti-tampering mechanisms on the game client. This is very common. You can monitor for certain security events. You can say, hey, if a player is moving at 50 times the speed they're supposed to, then something's probably up. They're not supposed to be able to do that. Uh, you can do, and this is part of cheat and fraud analysis. You can also do IP whitelisting for uh, certain applications uh, if, 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 uh, if appropriate. A lot of times this will help uh, curb attacks. So that's more of the technical risks. Getting into the attack and defense. So there's, there's the silver, silver bullet approach. That works. Not a lot. You want to rely on a layered approach. So there's relying on a single control. That it's just, it's not going it, to, it might work in certain situations, but it's not going to work in the long run. You want to have, uh, let's, let's take, for example, if, I, if, if I'm going to protect using a layered approach, uh, layered protection approach, I'm going to protect premium items in, in a mobile game, say, that I shouldn't be able to get unless I'm s submitting money through some uh, payment method. I could, I could uh, or, or maybe it, let's say it's a premium in-game item for a desktop. I shouldn't be able to reverse the client. You want to make it difficult for attackers to reverse the, clients th the client that's used to make that, um, to use the premium item, say. So uh, that way that, that I couldn't modify the client to say, hey, I'm using this upgraded item, even though I don't have the upgraded item. It wouldn't make sense if, if, if I could modify that. But let's say, let's say um, that you've got anti-tampering covered. You're good. Your game can't be reversed, which it always can. But let's say that it's really, really difficult. So then I'm going to, as an attacker, I'm going to go to the next layer down, which would be the network encryption or the network layer. And I'm just going to send spoof packets. I'm not even going to use the game client. Avoid it entirely. So then if you make, it, if the, if you make the network encrypted, it's going to be a lot more difficult than sending plain text traffic. As an attacker, I can sniff the wire and see the plain text just go right by and say, OK, I'm going to give myself unlimited whatever. And, and uh, as, an, as an, uh, a defender, if you encrypted that data, it would have been a lot harder for an attacker to, to sniff that and, and replicate it. Similarly, server-side checks um, are very useful for identifying, let's say the game client says, I'm going to use a premium item and gain whatever effects you would gain. 
a simple server-side check to make sure that the person actually purchased that item is a quick fix for this. But that wouldn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily happen on these on games. People just assume, well, if I can send the data that says I'm using it, then I must have bought it. Not always the case. Uh, t taking the offensive approach, uh, the offense, uh, the, there's the general hacking process, like I said, of thinking of a goal, like getting unlimited health or gaining access to certain restricted parts of a map so that I can, or, or maybe performing uh, uh, power, powers and moves and whatever uh, level 80 moves might be out there that I can not perform at lower levels, you know, if I'm a level 15 character and I'm performing stuff that's way out of my league, that should be a red flag. So, if, so that I would pick as a goal. And then I would plan out how I want to reach that goal, goal. and taking, going through the layers of, of uh, security here. You can modify the game at runtime, the client at runtime or on disk, depending on the protections in place. One might be easier than the other. Or find out how to send spoof network packets to the server, or look for server logic flaws in general. So then you execute the attack. But it's, it's a very methodical approach as opposed to just jumping in and seeing how do I hack it. So let's say there, there's this game, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Ghost in the Shell Code, uh, they had a CTF in 2015, and uh, it was called Pony Island, or Pony Adventure 3. And so I'm going to use that as an example here for how to get uh, unlimited ammo. Um, or or just, just not the unlimited ammo quite yet, we'll get to that in the demo, but just in general, like how, how would I hack the game? So I would find out how to modify the client if I wanted to pursue one of these goals, like, like unlimited ammo. And I can use a game trainer that I can create, or I can find tools available that, that provide this functionality pretty easily. And this works because there's no anti-tampering mechanism. Uh, so if there was any obfuscation or any um, sort of encryption of the game client or so any, any form of protection, this wouldn't be as easy as it is. Um, or I could find out how to send spoofed network packets to the game server. You could proxy traffic. So assuming, let's assume, that the, the, the client itself, the game client, was protected, it would be possible to proxy network traffic. So instead of, instead of saying the game connects to the end server, you would say the game actually connects to your proxy, which then sends it off to the server. And then you modify all the traffic in between. That way you get around that whole uh, issue of the game client being protected. Or you can look for server-side flaws itself. Perhaps check f to see whether or not uh, the, the ammo count that you claim to have is what the server actually thinks you have. And if, it, if, that, does, if that check is not performed, then you've got, you've, you've got a, uh, a winning situation. In this case, there's one little flaw. Uh, if, if in the case of this, this game, uh, the game server is released, it was, it's already been released. So as an attacker, I can say, hey, I'm going to host this game. It's great. You come join it. I've got, I've got all the perks you want. And I just happen to give myself unlimited rights or whatever. And this, is, this would be the case for you know, an administrative user. It would make sense. But Sometimes uh, there's other common games out there where you run your own you, you run your own client, and it's assumed, well, you can't hack the client. So, well, you can. <laughs> so, as somebody who's hosting a local LAN party, you have complete control of everything, and you can you can give yourself unlimited advantage, uh, whereas your team members might be restricted by what the server itself is checking for, team and enemies. So gaining unlimited ammo in, in, in this game is simply uh, performed by identifying where in memory is the am ammunition stored. It's stored at that address that I'm not going to read off to you. And I have 29 am ammo in my, in my clip. Then I'm going to identify the instruction that points to that address, or that writes to that address, excuse me. So every time I pull the trigger, I fire a bullet, that ammo count goes down. So what's changing that, that ammo count? That address right there. It's a move instruction in assembly, for those of you who are familiar with it. And then I take that, since I control the game client, or I control the server, whatever, 
uh, we're attacking here. I'm going to modify that so that instead of decrementing the, the uh, ammo count, I'm just going to not do anything. I do a no op, which is uh, no operation. And so that's the, the byte 90 right there on the far, far right. It does nothing. So instead of doing something, which would be the decrement of the ammo count, I do absolutely nothing. And therefore, I gain unlimited ammo. That's how it works. So I'm going to show how that uh, happens here. All right, so let's say right here, uh, we see over here I've got 30 ammunition. And then uh, I'm going to open up my game trainer here. This is available online, by the way, for those who want to, to find it. Uh, it's called Cheat Engine. It's pretty useful. Uh, so I'm going to search for that ammo count that I have, which was 30. So I perform the search, and it narrows it down, narrows it down for me to 87,000 addresses. Not really great for what I need. I'm going to need a little more specifics. So I switch back to the game client. And fire a bullet. Goes to 29. So I search for 29. And then I perform a scan, and I see that only one address out of that previous list uh, that all held the value 30 of addresses, I find now out of that list, there's only one at this point in time that has the value 29. So I know I've identified my, the, the ammo count. But I just want to make sure. So I'm going to change it to 20. And look, ammo count, now it's 20. And I look over here, it's 16. I bump it up to 30, switch back, it's 30. So I've just modified the ammo count of this game. Pretty cool. The problem is, if I'm running around and shooting everybody and doing my thing, I'm not going to want to switch back and forth over and over and over and over. That's not going to be fun. It would be better to just run around and actually find the ammo itself than to do that. So what I do is attach a debugger and say, OK, I'm going to set a hardware, hardware breakpoint on that address that says, OK, break, on, on break the client, cause, cause the client to just stop executing. If that address has something written to it. So I do that, I fire a bullet, and I see that an address pops up. And that's that move instruction that we showed earlier. And it moves some data around, but basically that's what decreases the ammo. So what I do here is I open up my disassembler, and I say, I'm going to change that to the no operation that we previously discussed. And now, when I go back to the game client, now that there's a bunch of no operations, when I fire the bullet, or when I fire the gun, it doesn't actually decrease the ammo at all. So that's how a, a very, very simple unlimited ammo hack would be performed. Now, this is not taking into account anything like, um, what do you call it, uh, server-side uh, checks or anything like this. This is assuming that the server doesn't check anything like that. So, <clears throat> so here I'm jumping around, showing you how high I can jump, how fast I can move. I got ADHD. I, I, I got to go faster than this. So I made some scripts because I, I can't wait. I'm not, I'm, I'm not patient. I want to I wanna have moon jump, and I want to have super speed, and I want to have unlimited ammo. So now I can jump a little higher. That's by doing the same ty types of type of process. I can go a lot faster. I can run around, do all sorts of kind of things. But this is simply by modifying the game client. And this stuff isn't normally you know, possible. Now look at uh, how fast that bear, it, it took forever to, to, to shoot the bear down. So I'm going to just bump up how much da damage the, the rifle does, so that instead of having to stand there for a whole, f like two seconds, I just fire one bullet and he's gone. Um, it's just, it just makes my life a lot better. Um, but the thing is, uh, I haven't done this little check for, uh, what do you call it, um, health. So as I've got this game going, or excuse me, I'm, I'm showing you here, um, I got ahead of myself. So we've got uh, a few of the guns and things in the game. 
that I've show, I'm showing you here at the bottom, we've got how much damage it normally does, and that's like eight, or B damage. Can't really tell. B damage. So the value B in hex is, I think, like 11 or something. And so instead of that, I bump it up to one zero zero zero, a whole bunch of zeros. So it's a lot more damage. I do that for all the guns, or a few of them. I think there's more in the game. As you can see there, oops, if I can go back a little bit. The, uh, well, oh well, it, it showed that it did a lot of damage. And you can see that when I just fire a single bullet. Um, you can also see that my health is at 999. It's because I've enabled this little modification where I've searched. You can see it kind of jumped down to seven, or at 979. And then when another bear comes over, it goes down to 959 sometimes. That's because I have this health uh, locked. So what I'm doing is like every 50 milliseconds, I'm resetting the value at that address to 999. So if I unset it, then you see my health go down real fast. I don't like that. So I freeze my health at a bit higher value. Um, yeah. So then take out the bears. But I, I don't, it's still kind of slow for me. Um, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not happy with it being so slow, and, and I can only jump like as high as a tree. And that, to me, that's just kind of boring. I mean, it's not the greatest. So in this game, you can actually walk on water. That's not a hack. So I'm going to enable super moon jump and super speed, and then you can go a little bit higher. Um, and these are just modifications. I mean, I'm doing some simple floating point modifications. You can find all this. Um, online it, it, at uh, my GitHub, Carter Jones. And I've got a little uh, cheat table thing that you can download and mess with. But basically, that's how you hack a game client. And assuming that the server side doesn't check this sort of stuff, you're free to fly around. And it's, 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 this is a tremendous advantage that players have. They can, I mean, I was able to jump out of the um, starting point. The starting point of the game is kind of like you're in a little cave. You can just jump out of it. No clip. I'm done. <laughs> I don't have to do any of that you know, starter stuff. I can just run around and uh, have fun. So that's the demo. And then uh, going over to, if you noticed, when I did the unlimited health in this game, I had to freeze the value. If I had made it so that decrementing the health was impossible, say, you know, using the same technique as the, the gun ammo, everyone in the game has unlimited uh, health. And I actually tried this, and I got in an endless firefight with a bear. Um, so that, that just doesn't, doesn't do much for you. So in these situations, what you want to do is identify key addresses. And then identify patterns in memory that can reveal structures, such as the player structure, or the bear structure, or the whatever structure. And then identify certain offsets that you might see, um, such as their x-axis position, the y, the z, you know, where, where in the map they are, and then how fast they're going. That's what the velocity might be, or the direction they're facing. There's a bunch of things that might be contained in a single player object, such as health, shields, and visibility. And instead of saying that I can't decrement the health, I would simply freeze that value for that one player. Because if I remove the ability to take damage, it would affect everyone. everyone. And I only, wanted to, I only want to be the one that gets unlimited health. So I would freeze my, my value at a, uh, at a preferred uh, amount. Uh, Client-side protections will help out with this tremendously. So you guys saw how I very quickly, I mean, it was less than five minutes, and that was with me talking, how I did uh, some, some simple hacks. If, uh, if, if any of this code had been obfuscated, if any of it had been uh, perhaps encrypted, or just a simple check to see, hey, is, this, is somebody debugging this? There's a, there's a Windows API call you can make that says, is debugger present? If it is, crash the clients, send cheat reports, whatever. The game doesn't, does, doesn't do that. Uh, and this can be 
Uh, obfuscation can be applied to all parts of the game or just portions of it that are critical. Um, and it's, it's sometimes there's some encryption that's applied um, to certain portions, but sometimes it's to the entire binary. And when the game loads, then the binary is decrypted at runtime. So that makes run or excuse me, uh, analysis based off of an image that's stored on disk very difficult. So oftentimes people will have to load the game, take a memory snapshot, and then perform analysis off of that. But if you're encrypting portions of the game and then decrypting them when you need to use them and then re-encrypting them, then that makes that sort of analysis even more difficult. So there's a lot of those sort of techniques people can use. Anti-debugging, like I mentioned, if it's enabled. Um, sometimes people want to allow the game to continue. I've heard of this. Um, I heard a talk by one gentleman who said they identified who's making the game trainers and then they'll say, okay, so that person's making a game trainer and then they're releasing it and other people are downloading the trainer and using it to hack. They'll ban all the people that use the trainers but not the developer. So then they keep identifying who are the cheaters and they just ban all those accounts. The developer's saying, it's not me, I, I'm not getting hacked, I don't know what's wrong with you guys. It's a little game that they'll do that. So you won't necessarily want to crash the executable. It's kind of how you want to play the game with hackers. Um, and then there's runtime integrity checks. So you saw how I modified the code at runtime. If there had been something in the code to detect that change, something might fire off and say, hey, this code was modified. Do you want to reset it to what it should be? Or do you want to flag it as cheating? Something like that. Um, and then there's that's, that's good for doing uh, identifying some non-debugging based routines, uh, write process memory, virtual alloc, that sort of things. So, um, Then there's network based attacks. So let's say you've protected your game client, you've done a great job at that, fantastic. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to proxy it. Okay, I'm not going to touch the client. That's easy. <laughs> if uh, This goes back to what we were saying earlier about if the, if the network is plain text and all the, the traffic is plain text, it doesn't matter if your client is super protected. I can just falsify data and send it. Um, or you can, you can modify the server traffic. Let's say for whatever reason, I'm able to take apart a certain portion of the game client that has to do with like the game's decryption and encryption mechanisms for the, the traffic, the network traffic. I might be able to uh, figure out how to do some sort of uh, attacks that way, uh, which is why it's good to obfuscate uh, your, your clients. And these sort of things can be used to, like I mentioned, mo uh, mention which mobs or, or uh, enemies are on a map. Or sometimes you can, you can identify, okay, there's 50 different enemies on the map and sometimes you, you, they call it grinding and you'll, you'll uh, try and kill all the little enemies on the map to, in order to look for the one that has the super awesome item that you're, you're looking for. But if you have a network uh, client and server where the server sends you all the data in advance and you already, you, technically your client knows which of the enemies has this, the awesome item if you just modify uh, or you make you know, a proxying tool that can identify that and it points it out to you. I've, see, I've seen this on, you know, a, a friend of mine had the game client and then a second monitor with the map viewer and it said, okay, that's where this, the, the special item is. He just ran over, killed that one enemy, took the super item and then was on his way. And it was really s simple and it's because the client gets all the information it needs, it just doesn't show it. It's not visible. Um, then there's uh, speed and teleport hacks. If you say, hey, server, I'm actually over there, 100 miles that way. I know I was right 100 miles back here a minute ago, or actually a second ago, but I'm, I'm there now. And the servers say, okay, cool, you're there now. So you just teleport it over there. That, it's, it's real simple. Um, sometimes it's a bit involved. Um, cool, thanks. So then if you wanted to go the super, um, extreme method, you could just exploit the server. If you found a way to identify a vulnerability in the server itself, you could get remote code execution take over the server. That's a bit more in depth and, and, and it certainly is an, uh, an attack that um, certain attackers will pursue. 
because if you, you know, because of all the business risks that we mentioned earlier, sometimes cheating isn't an attacker's main goal. Sometimes it's denial of service to cause the company to go down for you know, a certain number of days, which causes profit loss, which causes you know, all that sort of stuff. And an attacker might be financially backed by some other party that wants to see that company um, hurt. So they'll do that, um, something like a remote uh, uh, I, uh, targeting logic vulnerabilities or implementation vulnerabilities, flaws and bugs. So there's server-side protections you can do to, to combat some of these things. So only sending data that the client needs to know. Uh, we, this has happened as well with um, map information sometimes. Um, you, can, you can send the data about the, the enemies. If you're, you're farming or you're, you're grinding, you need to find out which enemy has the special item. Well, if you only know about the, the enemies, once you, like, when, what they have inside of them, once you've killed them or you know, done whatever you're supposed to do, at that moment, that's going to that's gonna reduce that sort of um, sniping sort of approach of just killing the one enemy that you need to kill. You also need to consider, excuse me, consider all data from the client is potentially ma malicious. This is the case with any client-server interaction. Doesn't matter if it's video games or whatever, and website, it, anything. Um, and so you want to take that into careful consideration in your architecture. Uh, you want to also compare data received from the client to an acceptable range of expected data. So uh, like I was saying with teleportation or um, saying that I have, an un I have a premium item and trying to use a premium item when I actually don't have it, um, making sure that that's in an acceptable range of possibilities. And if that causes too much of a performance hit, you can just do a random sampling. Yeah, it's not going to catch everything, but it might catch repeat offenders. Um, and, and that's sometimes better than nothing. So stepping back from video games specifically, there's, this applies to a lot, of the, a lot of industries that are interested in similar security concepts. A lot of, uh, a lot of overlap, in fact, with media and entertainment uh, industries. So let's say financial institutions financial institutions, these same principles apply to banking websites or stock training applications or ATM transactions. These, these sort of things can be applied, these same attacks can be uh, applied. So for ATM transactions, who's to say that I don't just split that cable that hooks the Ethernet cable into the router? Who, who's to say I don't just like set up some sort of uh, device on that cable or, or split it and then reconnect it to my device and then I'm, I'm intercepting everything? If there's no um, secure transfer of data, then the attacker just scored. Um, similar with stock trading or bank website, whatever. Um, similar also with media and entertainment, as I mentioned. Uh, video streaming restriction bypass. If, if the DRM is not enforced, then uh, people can get what you're offering, your streaming services, for free. Copyright protection of physical media. The, the list goes on. These are just to very few examples uh, as, as to where these types of attacks can also apply outside of the video game industry. So in conclusion, video game security is not just about preventing cheating. It also uh, varies by businesses and tech business type and technical risks uh, by genre, platform, etc. Some of the risks are unique to the industry and some aren't. Some of there's crossover. Uh, layered defenses are very, very important because if I can find a weakness in any layer, then I've won. And uh, like we were saying earlier, both attack and defense processes apply to more than just the video game industry. So are there any questions? Question. We've got one in the back here. On. Yeah. Hi. So uh, in addition to some of the techniques you described for the companies, the video game companies, to detect cheating, have you ever talked to any of them about participating in bug bounties? Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely one approach a lot of companies take. Um, and it can be effective to a certain degree. Um, it just depends on what the company's goal is. 
Um, bug bounties can, can certainly find a lot of the more low-hanging fruit if you have a few skilled attackers in the audience that really understand a game. We've, we've seen it where uh, participants will actually understand the game a bit more than the developers themselves. And that's great to get a, a, an outside, outsider's perspective on the game. Um, I've also noticed that with bug bounties in particular, the community around it um, seems to respect the company a bit more. Uh, when they say, hey, we're, we're trying to secure our product, help us help you. And so that, that generally increases um, the, the company's uh, reputation among the, their, their, their clients, their, their the people that are buying their services and games. So yeah, it's, it's usually pretty beneficial. Yeah. Do you find that game companies are actually receptive to um, actually patching security flaws as opposed to regular software and banking organizations? See, that's going to vary by company as well. Right. Well, uh, I know I know Blizzard and Riot and those big names, they will they care about security, but yeah. most game companies actually don't care about security. I mean, it just depends on how much money you're making. Right. <laughs> okay. Like do you have the do you have the ability? Do you have the it, it is it always comes down to a business decision. Is there a business justification for fixing these security risks? Because there, if there isn't, if I'm going to spend you know, $10 million on fixing a risk that's going to, get, going to lose me only $500,000, why am I going to do that? You know, sometimes it's an accepted risk. So um, yeah, it's, it really depends on the company. It really depends on their uh, income stream and, and their um, upper management kind of understanding, or, or not understanding, but their upper man management prioritization of risk. So yeah, it'll vary. Any other questions? Looks like we have about a minute left. So I don't know if I'm able to say, but if we if you come talk to me afterward, I'd be happy to share. It was really fun. It got me started on it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Is Cheat Engine illegal? Yes. No. Um, sp I specifically picked this game. Um, Cheat Engine is a tool. It's a, it's a tool to do reverse engineering, a lot of memory modification, reading, writing, scanning, that sort of stuff. The tool is not illegal. What I did is also not illegal. Um, it is a game designed to be hacked. It was part of a, a capture the flag um, game. Uh, instead of just having a vulnerable website, they decided let's make a vulnerable game. So I was demonstrating off of that, yeah. But if you're going around and, and hacking without a company's permission yet, yeah, I, I guess that could be considered illegal at, or just a break, breach of the EULA, it just kind of depends. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. Any other questions? Cool, thank you so much.